Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to LEAD, Leading Equity and Diversity. I am Dr. Debbie Willis, pronouns she, her, hers, and I lead the DEI certificate program at the University of Michigan Rackham Graduate School. We started this series because scholars wanted to hear from real people, their experiences leading equity, diversity, inclusion, and, in just, and social justice efforts. We thank you all for joining us today. Given all that's going on in the world, we really appreciate your presence here. You received the prompt that the session is being recorded. And though your audio and video is muted, we encourage you to engage in the conversation through the question and answer portal. We love to bring your voices into the room. If you see a question that you also like to hear the response, please like or upvote that question. We ask the questions with the broadest interest first. We ask that you remain patient with us as we have close to a thousand of you who have registered and we had lots of questions from registration. We will not get to all of them in one hour, but we're committed to continue the conversation and have dedicated this lead webinar series to address racial equity for an entire year. And we invite you to join us each month. This lead conversation will address the need to have people of all social identities involved in the fight against racism. We, how can we avoid the us versus them mentality and mobilize as a unified force against racism? Our featured guests, Howard Ross and Sonia Jacobs, will discuss pathways to bonding and bridging across difference. Howard is a lifelong social justice advocate and is considered one of the world's seminal thought leaders on identifying and addressing unconscious bias. He is the author of the Washington Post bestseller, Everyday Bias, Identifying and Navigating Unconscious Judgments in Our Daily Lives. And he will have a revised edition of that book coming out next week on July 30th. And I'm really excited about that. He will also be discussing his latest book, Our Search for Belonging, How Our Need to Connect is Tearing Us Apart. Sonia Jacobs is the University of Michigan's Chief Organizational Learning Officer and Senior Director of Faculty and Leadership Development. Sonia and Howard, can you please get on now and introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your journey as a leader in the space of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. Howard, can we start with you? Sure, thanks, Deb. It's so good to be with everybody. I am, as you know, I have uh, two of my sons who are University of Michigan graduates. So, uh, so U of M has always had a special place in my heart. So I'm glad to be with everybody and, uh, and also some of the folks there who I've worked with. You know, I've been doing this work my whole life in one way or another. I went to my first civil rights meeting when I think I was 16 years old, which is now like 53 years ago. And, um, and we've gone through many changes. And at some point I figured out a way to make a living based on my passion. So I've been doing diversity and inclusion work in organizations now for 35 years. Um, and a lot of it just came out of my own family background. I'm, my family is, I'm Jewish. I'm from uh, my family's from Eastern Europe, and we suffered enormous loss during the Holocaust. So I grew up right in the shadow of that being born in January 1951. Um, I think that, you know, we've seen evolution over the years. And, and um, the question that I know I'm confronting, and I'm sure many are confronting, is whether this moment that we're in will become a movement. Um, I've seen some people refer to this as the potential for a third reconstruction. The first, of course, being after the Civil War, the second being the civil rights movement of the 60s and, and now the possibility of moving this to another level. Um, but at the same time, we know we're also getting a lot of counter reaction. Um, and so it's, it's basic Newtonian fig, uh, physics, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And so I think it's important, uh, and I know we'll talk about this today, for us to be incredibly thoughtful um, about uh, how we deal with this. And, and it's also distinctly different whether we're talking about a university environment or a um, or a corporate environment or a civil society kind of environment. So, um, so there's, there's a lot for us to talk about today. Sonia 
Yes. Hi, Debbie. Thank you so very much uh, for inviting me. And I'd like to say hello to my uh, counterparts in this work uh, that are out there uh, in the audience uh, joining us. Uh, it is a privilege uh, to be in this discussion uh, with Howard, who I had the opportunity to work with a little over 10 years ago um, with the health system uh, leadership, where he came to share you know, the scientific and the business perspective of uh, DEI efforts, and that went a long way. And then, you know, fast forward to 2016, when we were able to engage Howard's company in bringing the unconscious bias uh, training uh, here to Michigan. Uh, but a little bit about my uh, journey to DEI advocacy and leadership, uh, like uh, Howard, I think I was destined uh, uh, to do this work. Uh, my father was an organizer uh, for the Detroit Walk uh, for Freedom in 1963. I was not yet born then. I came <laughs> a few years uh, after that, but um, activism and advocacy has been a part of my uh, life uh, for a very long time. And then um, and with that walk, that being, you know, the precursor for uh, the walk uh, in Washington that did actually occur a couple of weeks after that, uh, it was always instilled in me that I had to take action when I saw, you know, uh, something wrong. But then my lived experience uh, has truly, you know, been a journey. Uh, in DEI advocacy and leadership. Uh, I remember going to Catholic school uh, in the city of Detroit and it was predominantly African-American, but my teachers, the clergy, the nuns, 90% of them uh, were white. When I attended college uh, west of here, uh, I'll say that, <laughs> uh, um, I attended you know, that college, 3% of the student body was minority. And I remember you know, bumping shoulders and elbows on the sidewalks with white males who refused to share you know, the path. And so I've had a lot of experience in DEI uh, advocacy and leadership development, working for minority owned and majority owned companies that were committed to diversity, and then having the great fortune of bringing that work and experience to Michigan uh, in 2002, you know, where I was training diversity um, education for all of the health system leaders, some 600 uh, leaders there. And I think it was truly the commitment that Michigan Medicine had at that time, it was the health system uh, to diversity, equity, inclusion, that I thought I saw opportunities for change. And then when President Slissel uh, convene the groups um, to create our strategic plan, our five-year strategic plan for diversity. I really feel as though there is a time and we will uh, be able, I think, to make change right now. So I'm glad to be a part of this journey um, with the University of Michigan. So thanks for having me. Great, thank you both for being here. So we received a lot of questions. One of our questions is, education plays a role in fighting systemic racism. What comes after basic unconscious bias training? And how do we move people to connect more deeply across differences after learning of their biases? Howard, you wanna start? You're muted. I'm sorry, my computer froze for a second. Can you ask the question again, please? Yeah, no problem. Education yeah. plays a role in fighting systemic racism. What comes after basic unconscious training? And how do people move to connect across differences after learning their biases? Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, I think it's really important. I think a lot of times see unconscious bias, people see unconscious bias work in, in the wrong context. And sometimes I hear people say, you know, well, this is letting people off the hook. And so I think, first of all, it's important for us to realize that systemic racism and bias are like um, twin siblings that support each other. You know, the system of systemic racism uh, comes from what, what Brian Stevenson calls the narrative of racial difference in our mm -hmm. culture. And we know that that gets created 
uh, through everything we learn growing up. And, and underneath that, the connective tissue of that is all the biases that we're taught, all the assumptions that we make about, about different people. Um, and then of course, what happens is because we have those assumptions, we create structures and systems in society which are consistent with that. So policing, um, uh, restricted living circumstances, access issues relative to quality education, healthcare, you know, all kinds of other things. You know, so all of that stuff creates a system that's consistent with the narrative we have. And then that system, of course, produce results which are disparate results because if you don't have ac same access to quality education, you don't have access to health, you don't have access to all these other kinds of things, then the outcomes show up in a disparate way. And those outcomes then perpetuate this narrative of racial difference. So we can see we're stuck in this conformational system. So we've got to attack that from two directions. One way is the more individual way, and that is to look at how our biases give us the world that we see and allow us to accept things that we shouldn't be accepting in front of us. You know. Uh, various different forms of, of bigotry um, to subtle forms of micro behaviors, whether we call them micro aggressions or, or, or uh, other language that we use for that. And then at the other, so we've got to deal with those personal issues. And then at the same time, we have to look at the systemic kinds of application. You know, what are the policies, practices, and procedures that we need to change? How do we um, create systems and designs in our structures that are designed to catch those biases in action? But if we only work the systems without dealing with the biases, then I like to say to people, it's very much like um, losing weight. Most people I know who want to lose weight know exactly what they need to do to do it. The system is there, eat less and exercise more, but we don't do it because we haven't looked at what we have going on internally that has us resist those systems. So it's a both and not an either or. Yeah, Thank I you. have to agree uh, uh, with Howard there. I think uh, when it comes to our own learning, we're continuously learning. Okay, we always have to know that we have biases, and, and those biases are shaping our perspectives, right, and our our view on the world. So there is a need for continuous learning. Uh, also, we do have to think about those systems and practices, as, as Howard mentioned. You know, I think about our hiring practices. You know, are we very consistent with uh, how we go about bringing people into the organization? Is it based upon the values that we espouse, you know, as an organization? Are we checking, you know, ourselves when we are promoting people and why are we promoting them, you know, with the expectations and the qualifications, but also do they have the values that we want to see, you know, in the organization that we are trying to create. So we do have to have a very critical lens on all the systems that we have um, in the organization. And then personally, we've got to acknowledge our own biases. We've got to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. And then we've got to create space where people will make mistakes. And we have to create space where people are going to be uncomfortable. I remember somebody telling me as a DEI practitioner or a facilitator, if I'm not making people uncomfortable, I'm not doing my job. And it's in that <laughs> discomfort that we can begin to really talk about our biases and how they impact what we do, who we are, and how we lead. So it's a continuous learning journey, you know, inwardly as well as outwardly. Thank you. Yes, definitely a continuous learning journey. The next question is, given that people are more likely to stick to groups when they feel safe, what can we do throughout the year to create an organizational community and sense of safety for everyone? Sonia, you want to start here? Yeah, I, I think it begins with a uh, dialogue. Um, we've got to invite all uh, to the table for conversation and in doing so, create a safe space. Uh, I remember a uh, thought leader, Margaret Wheatley, talking about we're only afraid of the stories that we don't know. So we've got to be, bring people in so we could get to learn about one another, okay? Going back to my earlier comment, allow people to be vulnerable but also be clear on what our norms are. So we could come together, have different views and different perspectives, but we need to talk about our group norms, what's going to be accepted uh, or what's not. Be okay with being checked for what we say, you know, because we're going to make mistakes, okay? But always be thinking about that individual's intent. 
why they said what we said, and, and really help to um, impact that. So I think uh, having opportunities where we can come together for dialogue, be it, you know, in, in book discussions, in our staff meetings, you know, start every meeting with some reflection uh, uh, that gets at uh, some of the challenges that we're dealing with now and how are we feeling. Um, I can remember uh, a situation whereby I myself as the leader being the only African American woman uh, in that particular leadership team and being vulnerable and okay with saying we have a problem you know, and I feel burdened. But I knew that I could say that in that space because I was amongst what I would call allies. So in doing so, being vulnerable, we have to make sure that there are people who are around us that are gonna help us uh, feel safe and be okay with making uh, a mistake. And then I'd also say that uh, throughout the year when we're bringing groups together, you know, we have uh, approximately 50 people that participate in our FEP program. Debbie is one of them, which is the facilitator engagement program. Well, we have skilled individuals across the university that could assist leaders or groups in having some of these difficult conversations and so i want people to know that those resources are available because not everybody is comfortable with creating that space or having that dialogue so know that there are resources across the community the university community to help with those great howard did you want to add to that one well, I would just I would just build a little bit on what Sonia's saying because I, I couldn't agree more with everything she said. I mean, I'd like to say that the more we get to know each other for who we are, the less we treat each other like what we are. So those personal connections are so important. And, and part of that is understanding um, that that's built on our willingness to be vulnerable with each other. I mean, one of the ways this system is put in place, and, and I really recommend that people check out Resma Menachem's work around this, uh, Racialized Trauma, because he's doing some brilliant work. Um, he wrote a book called um, My Grandmother's Hands, which I'd recommend to people, is that we all carry this racialized trauma from our culture. You know, it's obvious that people of color have been traumatized by the culture because, because the culture has been so abusive over hundreds of years towards people of color. But white people also have a different kind of trauma, that, that is that we've had to find some way to deal with a culture that at our core we know is inherently unfair and inequitable, and yet we benefit from it. And that requires some kind of um, machinations that we all have to do in our inner world to justify the fact that the obvious is right in front of us, and yet we don't want to deal with it. And, and so from all directions, we have to deal with the, the the way this trauma has impact our way of being with each other. And it's important for us to understand not just our way of being with each other across race, but even our way of being each other within race. Because as you said in the question, you know, we do need to fit into the groups we're a part of. And this is the research that we did for my book, Our Search for Belonging. What we found was that this is our core human need, that in fact, Maslow was probably wrong, that, that our, our core need to belong may be more important even than our physiological needs, which is why you see things like suicide bombers, right? because belonging to the group is more important than my own personal physical needs. So in order to fit into our groups, we have to accept the narrative of our groups, which means that if growing up as a white person, that means I have to accept the narrative to some degree of white supremacy if I'm going to fit into my group. And yet there's another part of me at the same time that knows how fundamentally that wrong, wrong that is to every aspect of what I've been taught about what it is to be a good human being. And so, so when we talk about that openly with each other and we can share that vulnerability, we, that, begins to, that begins to give us a chance to bridge. Now, the one challenge with that, of course, is that we've been sort of given the impression that the way to do that is by singing Kumbaya together, or that these conversations are gonna be really nice and we're gonna have a conversation over a book group and we're just gonna fall in love with each other, you know? My experience has been that the most valuable relationships that I have with, with uh, people across race are, are, are relationships where we can battle it out. We know, we, we know we're coming from well intention, as Sonia was saying, we know we're coming from good intentions, but we're willing to argue, we're willing to debate, we're willing to challenge each other and even get mad at each other um, in the context of that because that's where the truth sometimes emerges. That's where the pain emerges. That's where people can really get how challenged we are, how afraid we are, and how sometimes threatening it is to let go of the power we have in the system. Yeah, thank you, Howard. So you both talked to the discomfort that's needed for growth. We had numerous questions around affinity groups or tribes. 
like how do you encourage people to do anti-racist work across difference when organizations including many on our campus are typically organized by single identities sonia yeah um i've got a lot a lot of thoughts there you know when our third pandemic which is what I've been calling uh, the racial uh, unrest after COVID, the financial pandemic, and then the racial uh, unrest. Prior to that, we were dealing with anti-Asian uh, uh, discrimination, right? Um, with reference to the COVID virus. And I remember telling a few colleagues, um, we have to come together in this discussion because it's people of color that are being impacted and disproportionately affected uh, by the COVID virus. And we won't be successful in ending systemic racism unless we are all working together. Now, we do know there is comfort in having our affinity groups, you know, and our tribes. We get a lot of our support, you know, there. But we have got to come together collectively to make a change. So examples of um, the work that we have been doing and engaging um, Indigo and, and NCID, the Women of Color, uh, APEDA. We have an Advancing Asians in Leadership uh, group uh, at Michigan Medicine and Advancing Inclusive Leadership as well. And it is requiring all of us to come together to talk about how do we support one another how do we be allies and, and to one another um, and bystanders? Each group still has particular challenges, as we know, 400 years uh, of that. But we all, I think, will contribute uh, to the solution. Um, and it begins by bringing those different voices and those different perspectives in to have a shared understanding uh, of what is happening and, and bring those different perspectives uh, to some of the solutions. Thank you. Howard, a similar question is how do we support affinity groups that create safe communities for marginalized groups while also encouraging those groups to build coalitions with out group members? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think that we, we one of the one of the challenges we have as human beings in general is we create false binaries. We create this sense that things are either or that don't have to be either or. And I think this is a great example of that. I mean, I think you know, there's value in having our own tribe. There's value, there's, there's something safe at a very deep level about having people who inherently understand a large part of your experience. And that's not to say, of course, that every person from any group is the same. I'm speaking archetypically now. We know that within any group, within any group we have intersectionalities, we have subgroup differences, um, and sometimes vast differences. But nonetheless, you know, people who are Black in America have a shared experience that's different than people from other groups, and we could go through each of the each of the uh, groups that Tony was talking about and find the same thing. At the same time, there's real value in bringing together people who have a shared commitment to have a breakthrough in that area. So, one of the things that I'm finding with some of my clients who are in more advanced stages of diversity inclusion work, for example, is that. Um, instead of having, let's say, um, a, a gender affinity group, they'll have a gender equity, or, or excuse me, a women's affinity group, they'll have a gender equity affinity group or, or a race equity affinity group. And then within those groups, they have times when they break out and they have separate sessions. So, so at the beginning of a meeting, if they come together for a couple hours, maybe the first hours they're in separate sessions based on racial identification, however people want to identify themselves, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and then in the second hour, of the meeting, they come together and share what they've seen separately and then say, how can we together work towards creating an environment that's safe for all of us? And so, and so you can kind of get the best of both worlds that way. So I think we need to break out of this either orness and see that there are ways to meet both needs because both of them have a, have a very clear um, importance to us. Thanks. So just a follow up to that. We had someone say that the word tribe is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, is there, any, this is one of those spaces where we're all learning and growing. That question actually came in with the word tribe, but do you all have any um, commentary around that? 
Well, I would just say that, you know, this, this has come up at different times and certainly there's certain no intention to offend. A lot of times people associate that that terminology with more indigenous peoples, but and, and the reality is that, that there have been tribes in virtually every culture on the planet. The language has been used by virtually every culture on the planet. So, you know, I do think as a rule, we have to be sensitive to that. And as the language evolves, uh, be ready to move on to other language. Great, thank you. How do we support affinity groups that create safe communities for marginalized groups while encouraging those groups? Oh, I already asked that question. Sorry. <laughs> I was say that okay, the next question is, <laughs> how can people generally, gener gently let well-intentioned allies know that they don't need to dominate the conversation? <laughs> Uh, you, you want me to jump in on this? Sure. As, as a well-intentioned ally who has on occasion dominated the conversation, I will say, um, first of all, um, uh, we need to, I think, I think there are a couple of things about this. First of all, we have to stop seeing ally as a noun that starts seeing it as a verb. That allyship is, um, is an active practice. It's not a badge to put on your chest or a bumper sticker to put on your car. Um, and, and that means that we have to be constantly engaged in the conversation um, with our with our partners who represent different groups from us. And, and part of that is being able to create um, the kind of open relationship where we get feedback. Uh, because despite our best intentions, we're all raised in a, in a system of, as I said before, uh, Brian Stevenson calls it this narrative of racial difference, which places me as a white person at the top of that system. I'm saying the way the system is designed. And, and other people below. So what can happen sometimes with the best of intentions is I may still be coming from, um, I may still be, I just got a note to speak a little louder. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, uh, I, I may be coming from the best of intentions, but not realize that my being is still built in the white supremacy, the white privilege that I was raised in, in this system. And it's only by people giving me feedback sometimes that I can notice that because for me, it's just a normal way of being. And as much as I work on it, I can tell you, like I said, I've been doing this work for 50 plus years. And there's still times when blind spots come out because it's inherently part of the air we breathe in the system. So creating those kinds of open relationships where we can give each other feedback um, is, is really important. And, and that means you know, tell it to me straight. You don't need to be, you don't need to bat me over the head with a sledgehammer with it. But at the same time, you don't need to protect my little ego. Because if my ego is so frail, that being told that my attempts at, at allyship um, are not as effective as they might, that makes me run away, then I'm not being a real active ally anyway. Thank you. So Sonia, this one's um, in higher education. It asks, what steps can students or staff take when we see faculty causing harm? What can students do specifically given the power dynamic? How do you avoid the us versus them mentality about race when there's also a significant power differential? Yeah, uh, um, that is a, a problem that we have. and We know we have to break down uh, these systems that reinforce the power differentials. We've had this discussion related to the sexual harassment and misconduct uh, 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 issues that we have. Um, we as an organization, we got to be consistent uh, with what we say and what we do. Okay? There are reporting systems. And when individuals report uh, instances of discrimination or harassment, they are acted upon. Um, we might not be following up uh, uh, with individuals as they may like, but um, we've got to be really clear what behaviors we're gonna tolerate. And we have to hold people accountable for those behaviors that are counter to the culture that we want uh, to see. Uh, but there are various reporting uh, mechanisms for students, staff, and faculty. There's the Office of Institutional Equity. Uh, our Dean of Students um, also has a reporting mechanism where they can report campus uh, climate uh, concerns. Um, Michigan Medicine has a compliance uh, hotline. There's a separate uh, hotline for our medical students as well. Uh, and then on the sexual misconduct uh, website, there's also another uh, reporting mechanism uh, there. But I would have to say as an organization, we gotta be really clear on what we value, 
what those behaviors look like, how we're going to hold people accountable and, you know, themselves and others accountable to those behaviors that we expect to see and then be consistent, you know, and how we go about um, addressing those. Thank you. I love it. Accountability, consistency, and anonymous ways to report. report yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Howard, I know from reading your work that you um, can respond to this question. It asks, I worry racism is becoming a partisan issue. How can we cut through that? How do we have critical conversations with people who have political affiliations or opinions, especially different from theirs? Look, I, I, I just acknowledge it's hard. I mean, it's hard right now. You know, I think, you know, when we look, when we look just at, at um, demographics of voting, we know that overwhelmingly white people um, supported President Trump and a, a relatively tiny percentage of people of color did. Um, and, you know, the, the same on the other side, you know, the reverse on the other side. So, so what's happened, and this wasn't always true. It's important for us to recognize that it wasn't always true that our political lines were so clearly drawn. You know, back in the 60s, you had, it was, it was more drawn by region. You know, you had more Northerners who supported the civil rights movement, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, and Southerners who were against it, whether they were Democrats or Republicans. So, um, so we've moved from what I call a bell curve society, where people are basically issue oriented. You know, I might agree with you about civil rights, but disagree with you about um, foreign policy and agree with you about gun rights, but disagree with you about something else to um, to a, 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 like on a bell curve, we would we would find our partnership. Now we're kind of in a dumbbell curve where everything's on the edges and nothing's on the middle. And it's no longer I disagree with you about an issue. It's now you're one of those kind of people. Now, it's understandable to feel that way. And it's there's no question it's frustrating. And you can feel like you're banging your head against a brick wall when you're dealing with somebody from the opposite end of the political spectrum. But there is still value, I would suggest, in finding people who, do, who we disagree with, who, who we can still have meaningful dialogue with. And, and while it's more difficult than it's ever been, I mean, as I think you know, uh, Deb, I, I interviewed over 100 people who voted for President Trump, which is definitely on the other side of the political spectrum than me for my last book. And, and a lot of them were really good, reasonable people who just saw the world fundamentally differently in certain ways or had a particular issue that was the issue for them, the litmus test issue for them, abortion, for example, or something like that. Um, uh, and then you had others who were, you know, the extremists. And, and so, you know, what I started to learn to do is to identify, you know, which were which so I could continue, try to continue the dialogue with those people who are more you know, towards the moderate side and, um, and less so towards the extremist side. The, the problem is where we've gotten now is there's a psychological phenomenon that some people call the backfire effect, where the more hard it is to defend the position, um, the more information people give you that challenges your position, the more you dig in. And unfortunately, that's happening now where people are getting more and more dug in. So I would say every time that we could do that, the better, especially with people um, in our lives who we really care about. You know, we, a lot of people find these splits even across their family, with their parents, their siblings, uh, people that close to them. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we, ha we all have a responsibility to try to keep our society knit together as we're moving forward social, ch moving forward social change. Because if we don't, what's inevitably going to happen is the pendulum will swing back in the direction of social change and in the, in the direction that we consider to be positive, and then we'll have it swing back in the other direction and that windshield wiper will continue to get wider and wider all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Debbie, I would like to just uh, uh, make a, a comment because um, I, I think that this is a really important topic uh, mm -hmm. related to uh, people's political views and having space to have some discussions as we prepare for November. <laughs> and I even leading up to that, we have got to be equipped to have safe space to have conversation. I remember in 2016, um, our um, office had literally just opened up the organizational learning uh, uh, office had just opened. The president had announced the month uh, before our strategic plan for diversity, equity, inclusion. And the day after the election, we were flooded with requests for people to come out to units to help facilitate a conversation because people weren't feeling safe, right? Um, they, they had their views and we needed to acknowledge that 
people have different views and we must listen. That's how we learn. That's how we grow in diversity, equity, inclusion. We're going to have people with different views, but how do we come together and have some conversation and dialogue about those views while respecting one another, you know, uh, who we are and like how we're sitting, not what we are. And we have got to prepare our community for, I think, a repeat of that in these next uh, couple of months. So all that we're doing now, these dialogues, you know, about how do we create safe space, we really need to do more of that as we move into the next few months. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a repeat or worse, actually. Well, I, th I think I think that that it's really clear that it's going to be like worse than anything we've ever seen, and um, and mm -hmm. most of us are are don't have the skills or the background experience to to be able to deal with this. I think that all so our all rules have been thrown to the side at this point, and so um, so it's going to be even more important for us to take our our own responsibility for for trying to do the kinds of things that Sonia is talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this topic is has we got many questions around this. I think everybody's anticipating that. The question specifically is how do we have those difficult conversations in a healthy way? How do we resolve the conflicts when they occur? Because we know they're going to occur. Yeah. yeah. Um. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say a learned behavior, I'm sorry, uh, and our, how to have difficult conversations, you know. Uh, we have to continue to practice that. And I think going into every conversation with some norms, okay, we're going to disagree, you know, uh, but how will we have, you know, that healthy dialogue, right, so that we can understand uh, each other's views. Um, we have formal programs that we offer, impactful conversations as one of them. Um, we have, uh, as some of you may know, an uh, uh, anti-racism uh, primer where we have um, uh, this group of very dedicated uh, individuals, uh, the AUA, Ask Us Anything, um, who've been getting questions related to that. And thank you very much, uh, Debbie, uh, for your work there. But um, it is uncomfortable. Okay, but we got to get the skills to be able to have those conversations and, and understand one's intent, but be safe in saying, I'm offended by that comment, okay? And then as an individual, accept that, apologize, and don't do it again, you know? Um, but it's going to require really us getting skilled <laughs> uh, to be able to sit with discomfort and have some really difficult uh, conversations. Yeah, I, I agree, and um, and I can actually share really quickly a, a very um, effective uh, but simple tool uh, for doing this, and it, it actually uh, comes from a woman named Elizabeth Lesser, who was one of the co-founders of the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, and I've si slightly adapted it. Um, she calls it taking the other to lunch, and that is, and it's it's a very simple choice, and, and I'll you know, list the four questions, but it starts, you make an agreement with the person who you're talking to that the purpose of our conversation is not to convince each other, not to talk each other out of each other's position, but just to understand more deeply why we believe what we believe. And then, and then you ask each other four questions and you each have a relatively equal amount of time to answer each question. So one person just doesn't dominate and talk over the person. So you say, okay, 10 minutes for each question or five minutes, whatever amount of time you have. So the first question is, what in your life experience has led you to take the point of view that you that you have and so the per each person gets a chance to share why they believe what they believe and they talk about their background experience again it depends upon how much time you have what's the reasoning for it how this ties into their personal values why it's important to them so that's the first one um, the second one is what frightens you about the other person's positions because underneath dissonance there's always some sense of fear so what are you afraid of about this other person's position uh, why is it that it's challenging to you why do you judge it so harshly and and you can actually get a chance to share how how you're afraid this might impact you or people you care about or the society or whatever it is so people actually get the fear that's on the other side then the third and this this question is really an interesting one and it's surprisingly impactful and that is what have you, what question have you always wanted to ask people from that side that you've never gotten a chance to ask before? So I was doing this one time in an immediate, using this technique, for example, as a mediation between um, a, a, a gay guy and a straight guy who had gotten into a public, 
you know, challenge. And, and at some point, the, the straight guy asks the gay guy, excuse the shortcut of language, but I just want to get to it here. Um, he, he says, uh, when did you decide you were, were, you were gay? when did you decide to be gay? You know, and, they, and the response he got from the other guy was, well, when did you decide to be heterosexual? And of course, the response was, I didn't decide. I always was that way. The gay guy said, exactly. And the guy's jaw dropped. He got sexual orientation as opposed to sexual preference for the first time. And then the last, the last um, question is, is there anything from your past that you need to clean up or apologize for to move forward? And this is an opportunity, an important opportunity for us to leave behind because all of us have, have participated in one way or another in behaviors that we're, that we're um, now look at and we say, what was I thinking at the time? But because we don't clean them up, because we don't have a line in the sand where we're saying we're no longer going to do that anymore, we sort of drag it with us like this guilty thing that happened to us, as opposed to saying, to be honest, there's sometimes when I've sat in a room and I've listened to people tell inappropriate jokes and I haven't said anything about it. I want you to know that I apologize for doing that. And I promise you that moving forward in the future, I will no longer do that again. And there's now a clean start that we can have with each other by doing that. So again, four questions are, what in your background gave you this point of view? Um, what is your fear or concern about the other background? Um, uh, what questions do you want to ask that you've never had an opportunity to ask before? And what do you need to do to clean up the past? And I can't tell you that anything works all the time, but this has been a very powerful um, tool that I've used with, in very difficult situations uh, very effectively. Mm -hmm. We can't hear you, Deb. I think you're muted. I said we will definitely send those questions out to you all following the um, workshop and our resources that we send to everyone. I'm going to bring in one of the questions from the audience since we're um, very interested in this topic. It says, what are some tips to compassionately bring discomfort forward in these conversations so that we don't create barriers of not only bias, but of guilt and shame? Brene Brown has talked about this issue, acknowledging shame, but not shaming. Did either of you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I'll be glad to jump in because I was actually just talking about that this morning. You know, there's, a, there's some wonderful work that's being done around this uh, in the restorative justice movement. And um, some people have, have, have called this circle, the circle of shame is what they talk about because we, this is one of the challenges that we have in diversity and inclusion work is that often, um, we've overused the currency of guilt and shame and overused it not in a sense that people weren't responsible for behavior, but there's a difference between guilt and responsibility. You know, guilt is more of a personal attack on, on people. And what happens is, as, as Brene talks about so brilliantly, when we're shamed, um, we can go in one of a couple of different directions. One is that we withdraw and contract and make ourselves wrong, which makes us incapable of moving forward in any positive way. I mean, we can, on the surface, do the things that people want us to do so that we don't get in trouble, but underneath the surface, we feel violated by it. Um, and therefore, like something, either something is wrong with us or the corresponding and opposite reaction, which is something's wrong with you for making me feel this way. This is where we see white fragility coming in in the way that Robin D'Angelo is talking about, that you made me feel uncomfortable by bringing up race, bringing up race therefore it's your fault, that, that mindset that can be there. And so what we wanna do is we wanna find a way to talk, to be willing to be uncomfortable because there's no way we can deal with this issue honestly without having some level of discomfort. Um, but we wanna do it while still giving people a chance um, for a path towards, uh, to use Dr. King's language, a path towards righteousness. So in other words, if we don't leave people a pathway where they can clean up the mess and move in a positive direction. And then all they're going to do is find other people and other circumstances where they can justify where they are. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting dance because we don't want to put people in a particular circumstance where they are, um, where they're responsible for other people's comfort. But on the other hand, we don't want to drive people into a cave that they can never come out of. Um, uh, and, and I wish there was an easy answer for how to do that, but keeping those things in mind is the best suggestion I can make. If I could add to that just uh, briefly, I think about some of the principles in difficult conversations uh, where we focus on the behavior or how it made me feel, right? Uh, and I think people can understand that versus it feeling like it's an attack on the individual. And we're going to have to be, you know, wrestle with that and be uncomfortable when somebody says to me, you know, what you said offended me and here's how I took it. 
And, and again, I'm going to have to say, I am sorry, and I'm going to work not to do that again. But then I may also invite that other person to help me think about what I might do differently uh, in the future. So we're working together, you know, on, on you know, uh, the resolution, rather, it, like you say, it's their problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I, could, if I could jump in just for, for a moment to build on what Sonia's saying, because I think that's so true and those kinds of tools, you know, the ability to deliver that message in a constructive way is possible. And I think one of the things that we need to do is to recognize that there are some people who are unconscious about doing this and there are some people who are very aware of what they're doing and we don't want to hit them with the same response. So if you start with the response by, like Sonia's saying, like for example, if one of the two of you were to come up to me and say, you know, Howard, you made that statement in the meeting yesterday and I, I want to tell you as the black woman, here's how it felt to me. If my response is, wow, I really apologize. That was absolutely not my intention. I had no idea it was coming across that way. Um, you know, I will definitely be aware of that in the future. And I want to invite you, if you ever see me doing that again, to give me feedback, you know, that's one response. If, and, and then maybe we're in conversation, then we go into a deeper conversation about it, as Sonia was saying. On the other hand, if my response is, oh, for God's sakes, Deb, you have to make such a big deal about everything. Why are you so thin skinned? Then my response is go for it. <laughs> then, the next time, then, then at that point, go ahead and let me have it because I deserve it at that point. But I think if we give, if we at least give people a chance um, we will find that a lot more people than we realize uh, do not want to be coming from the place that their conditioning has, has uh, led them to. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm going to stay in line with, um, with this questioning and go to one of the live questions. When Great. we create a space for uncomfortable conversations, only the converted tend to show up. How do we incentivize these conversations? How do we show the advantages that all of us can gain by building an overall together community? So it's one of those, you know, speaking to the choir type conversations. Well, I think that, you know, look, it's, it's hard. There's no question about it. And, and, it's, and, you know, the challenge is we're stuck kind of between a rock and a hard place in a way because what the research shows is that when you force people to participate in these conversations, it doesn't usually go well. Um, on the other hand, we force people to participate in all kinds of conversations all the time. You know, we tell people that they have to take certain classes as part of their, you know, academic tradition. We tell people that they have to, I mean, hell, I've seen organizations that forced everybody to take a two hour training on how to use a new phone system, but refuse to force people to, to make mandatory and diversity training. So, so, you know, there's some obvious contradictions and even hypocrisy in this. Um, I do think that it, that one of the ways that we can do this best is by understanding that people are at different maturation levels for these conversations. And there's certain people who could sit down and sit with each other for three days and you know, tear open the kimono and tell the heart and soul and really be engaged in that conversation in a really positive way. Um, but that's not the only way we can have these conversations. For other people, it may just be, you know, sort of a more 101 or 201 conversation to start to get them moving in the right direction. And I think that if we look at it from the standpoint of an entire, to use academic terms, an entire curriculum, you know, the, the student who's in, in chemistry 101 is not like the student who's taking advanced graduate chemistry. They're at a different level to understand things and the teacher or the facilitator has to recognize that and be able to work with different people in different ways. I, I agree uh, with Howard and the curriculum or the continuum, right? Because everybody is at a different place. And, yes. and you know, in the words of uh, the OD professionals, we have to meet them where they are and, and take them where we want them to go. But I think as an institution and as a community, we do need to have some set standards, right? Where everybody has an opportunity to understand early on, here's what we value and this is what we expect. So that's one way to get those that are not yet converted to understand our commitment and our expectations. And then truly make sure embedded in our systems, there's these opportunities for these regular conversations <laughs> about our expectations and our values and what we want to see um, in the organization. Some are going to come along and come over to the other sides and others aren't. Because I always think about this work. I can't appeal to your head, but I can't change your heart. But what we can do is say, this is what we expect to see in the organization. <laughs> and hope that, you know, throughout those conversations and those practices, we might be able to convert um, others. 
Yeah, I think that, I think another factor is that we have to recognize that um, you can never take people. Though I'm talking now to those of us who are facilitating or teaching this work, is that you can never take people any farther than you've gone yourself. Right. And there are an awful lot of people who are do, who are uh, practicing diversity work right now who have their own unresolved trauma that they're working through. And and if you're not careful. Um, you can look for the participants that you're working with to resolve your inner trauma. And so we need to always be doing our own work um, in order to keep our space clean. Um, and so we're, we're in a sense of equanimity so that we can hold space for other people. Because if you're a facilitator and you're not solid, there's no container for people to engage in. Um, it's a little bit like if you've got either a, 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 we've got a new puppy, you know, and if we put that puppy in our yard and our yard has, the fence in our yard has holes in it, we've got to watch him every minute of the day. We cannot take our eye off him because he might wander through one of those holes in the fence and go out into the street. But if that fence is secure, we can put that puppy out in the backyard and relax about it because there's only but so much trouble he's going to get in. And it's the same thing, you know, the facilitator has got to provide a solid container in which people can feel safe to roll up their sleeves and get to work with each other. And you can't do that if you're dealing with your own unresolved issues. Yeah, agree. Thank you. So Sonia, here's a question for you. Um, what structures can an organization put in place to hold people accountable when they behave counter to the inclusive culture that you just spoke of that the organization proclaims to have? Oh, well, quite a few uh, systems, I think. You know, we talked about the reporting systems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where people can report uh, anonymously when they see behaviors that are counter to um, what we believe. And at the same time, we've got to make sure that we have systems to support those who may be retaliated against because they've done that. Okay, so making sure we have those safe spaces um, um, are going to be really important. I also think, going back to my earlier comments around having values and behaviors, and are we evaluating or assessing people on those behaviors, the extent to which I am demonstrating those behaviors? And then if I don't, what are the consequences uh, uh, for that? And being consistent in how we apply those. We've got to do that or else we won't make um, any changes. But I think just systems of accountability but also reward and recognize. So for those that are demonstrating the behaviors that uh, we want to see, what are we doing to reward those? Great. So to follow up with that, how, and it's one of the things that you both um, actually addressed a little bit, how can we get our executive leaders more involved in the education and activities that promote inclusion, belonging, and unity? Yeah, I want to comment on that uh, quickly, if I can, because um, most recently, you know, there's been this interest uh, uh, to learn uh, and grow more. And I've said to many leaders, you've got to be a part of the solution. You've got to be open. Uh, you've got to be vulnerable. And you have to admit you don't know everything related to the, my lived experience or the lived experiences of others that are going through this and inviting them, you know, really to take the lead. So, for example, I've reached out uh, to one of my leaders to host a book discussion on, on white fragility, right, and uh, saying that it can't be me to do it. You as a leader have to demonstrate your authenticity and your vulnerability that you, too, are learning in this space. But know that there are supports for you, you know, as you go along that journey. I will say that I know that there are many leaders who have been engaging in intentional professional development in this space, looking at the cases around other uh, universities uh, that have had many incidences of uh, uh, racial uh, unrest. And really think about what would that look like here? You know, and what can I do in my leadership role uh, to make change? Uh, and so I think inviting them in uh, uh, and being honest and open with what we think needs to happen. But then I'll go back to our systems and our processes. You know, they've got to critically look at how they are hiring. Who are they hiring? Who are they promoting and why? and then making sure that we're holding people accountable for what it is that we want to see. That's how we need to be engaging our leaders in this work. 
Yeah, I would say, I, I, again, I agree. It's something that you and I are so in track. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, I think that one of the things that we also have to do is we can never stop making it clear to leaders how this affects the overall functioning of, in this case, the university. Um, you know, we, we've shifted dramatically as a body politic around this issue. A, a Washington Post study that I just saw yesterday, which was repeated in two week intervals because they wanted to see whether it was just an immediate response to the George Floyd murder or whether it was something that was more sustainable. So the 69% of Americans now say that they believe that there's systemic racism in their policing system. Now, just to give people a sense of comparison, uh, just six years ago after Ferguson, that same study was done and the number was only 46%. So there's been a 50% increase in just six years, which for somebody who studies data, that's huge, right? Um, so we, we know this is a systemic problem. People inherently know it. And, and we can't be, we can't get into this false equivalency where the tiny minority of people who refuse to see that systemic racism, for example, or, or systemic sexism is an issue for us as a society. We can't build our system on this notion that this is a, that on this false equivalency. This is something that any system, any university system, um, has to pay attention to in order to create a safe space for people to study, in order to create an environment where all students are going to flourish, in order to create a brand where all kinds of people want to come and study in your place, in order to, to create the kind of brand where people who graduate from that institution are seen as having had a good, round, well-rounded education. And so leaders who are not willing to engage in that conversation, it's not a function of them not liking diversity, it's a function of them not supporting the values of the institution. And then you have a question of, then you have a, a real serious question of, you know, how can we function when we have leaders who don't support our fundamental values? Well, I think that needs to be built. And once you, once you get people to really accept that and understand that, then there are lots of different methodologies for getting leaders in place. Sonia just shared a number of really perfect ones. Um, and there, there are others out there as well, but it's, starts with that sort of ontological shift, the shift in being where people really get, this is really who we are as a university. It's not some tangential thing that we send off to the diversity department. Exactly. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're almost at time, but we had a variety of questions around how do you create an inclusive environment for marginalized communities in predominantly white spaces? Like, the University of Michigan. Um, what kind of concrete, actionable steps can we take? Sonia, would you like to take that one? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, as I mentioned, um, I just think about uh, myself and, and what I do from a mentoring and coaching space, right? For those who don't see uh, a reflection of themselves in their area, being open, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for them to come and, and get uh, support. Our leaders have to recognize that we have individuals who feel marginalized in their areas and take responsibility for bringing them into the conversation, right? Uh, I'll go back to what you said about dominating the conversation, the well intended, right? You know, we have to identify those that aren't speaking up, who are not participating in events, and, and ask why because there's something that we are doing or not doing where they don't feel included and can be a part of uh, the conversations. So it's gonna uh, require that we get out of our you know, tunnel vision <laughs> and be open to others, right? But also let individuals know that they can come up to us or come to us uh, when they're not feeling valued or included or the environment is not supporting them uh, to thrive. Thank you so much. So what I want to say is I really want to thank the two of you for joining us today. I know we had numerous other questions that we won't get to, but we um, will continue this conversation monthly. And next month, we've had a variety of questions come in about how we can involve faculty into anti-racist work. So we will be discussing that specifically next month. So thank you both for joining us. I also want to take the time to, to thank our leaders at the University of Michigan, a few of our, a couple of our executive leaders who really are trying to push this work forward as well. So on the Michigan medicine side, we have Dr. David Brown, MD. He's an associate vice president and associate dean for health equity and inclusion. And he encouraged all of Michigan medicine to attend. So we greatly appreciate that. And I want to thank 
our Rackham Graduate School Dean and the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs of gra for Graduate Students for joining us today, as well as many of our Associate Deans in Rackham Graduate School. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you once again for joining us today, and I hope you join us each month to continue the conversation. You can continue to send us questions. We will get to them <laughs> eventually on some of the other webinars. With that, I'll say thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much, Deb. Thank you.